Very warm greetings to one and all in the blessed name of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Now let's turn to Philippians chapter 1. We've just begun in this book. Philippians chapter 1. We come to this meditation on these two verses. Look at verse 6. Being confident of this very thing, that he which have begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense of the confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Now there is a particular doctrine called the preservation of the saints, or some refer to it as the perseverance of the saints. Now this is one of the verse, verses used to support this doctrine in verse 6. Now, is it a correct doctrine? It is often misunderstood. It is also often maligned and sometimes can be taught wrongly. Now, we want to understand from scriptures what, it, what is this about, what this verse is about, what it should do to the Christian walk. And at the same time, the warnings that it gives. All right? So, now first and foremost, let's ask ourselves, what is this verse saying? What is this verse saying? Verse 6. Now, Paul says, being confident of this very thing. In other words, there is something in Paul's heart that he says, I am very assured of this very thing that he is going to talk about. He is so confident of it, so sure of it. Now, what is this very thing? He explains regarding believers that he which is God, he which, be, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. This is the very thing that he's very confident of. Now, what does it mean? It means that he says, now I'm very sure that God who has begun a good work in a believer, in you, in you, Philippians, who he was writing to, and to us who are reading this, God started something in you at a point in your life, and it's called a good thing. But he doesn't stop there. He says, he's not just saying God, start some, God started something good in you. But he says, in verse 6, now he will perform it. It is God who not may, might do it, but he will perform it. Now, what is this it? What is this perf perform what? Perform this good thing until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, not only Paul is so confident that what God has begun in you, that good work, he will not stop. He will not abandon project halfway in your life. He will not um, change his mind or forget or neglect his part, his work that he has begun. No, he says he will perform it. Now he uses the word until, until. He was so assured that this work will not be stopping halfway. It will be continuing until when? Until when? The day of Christ. The day of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the day of Jesus Christ? As we know in scriptures, this word is often used to describe now a period of time, or it can be the judgment day, Christ coming itself. Until the day that Christ comes to judge the world. Until you meet Christ face to face. So be even if it is before he comes, but you meet him face to face. He said, until that day. Now, in fact, after you, you, you meet him face to face, but the judgment, the great white throne judgment is not time yet. But God says it continues, that work that he has promised, this assurance, his promise to you, 
that lasts till the time of judgment. Now, the most important thing is it lasts till the day of Christ. Because if it is, well, not until the day of Christ, then you, not, you cannot be assured that at the day of Christ, this good work that God begun is still there, correct? So Paul did not want to say the day until the day you die. He said until the day of Jesus Christ. Now, then the question is, what is this good work? What is this good work? Now, in verse 7, you are partakers of my grace. My grace. Now, he is talking in verse 1 to the saints, the saints in Christ. Now, how do we become saints? We've studied that. We are saints because, well, the word means the holy ones, the set-apart ones. Because of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're reminded this morning. You and I are saints. In other words, we are saved, the saved holy ones. We are saints because of the grace, the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says, you are partakers of my grace. Paul already said, now I am saved by grace. He has always told the people, I'm saved by grace. And this is the grace that God gave to me, salvation grace. And you also partake of the same grace. He's not saying my grace means he, he bestows salvation. He knows of that saving grace in his life. And you also, the saints, you are also partakers of that same grace that I have, saving grace of Jesus Christ. So this good work, referring to the saints, refers to God's saving, salvific work in you. He begins that in you, and He will hold you till the day of Jesus Christ. Now when you think of that, then it simply means this. What is verse 6 saying? Paul says, now I'm very sure of this one thing. Do not doubt it. Do not fight against it. Now he says that God who has begun the work of salvation means he saved you. He saved you at one point. That is why you are called the saints. He saved you at that point and you, your salvation will remain sure until the day of Jesus Christ the day of judgment, you are saved and you enter into the rest of eternity as saved. So that is what Paul is so very sure about. Put it another way, God is saying that Christians who are genuinely saved, the saints, they will remain saved because God is the one not you. God is the one that will perform it, that will perform the keeping of your salvation till judgment. You won't lose your salvation. In other words, you remain saved. Now then you say, why do we talk about perseverance of saints or preservation of saints? Why is this doctrine called that? Now, please know these are still human words. Uh, people coin certain words to define certain theology. You can pick on the words and argue with it. All right? So, but the key thing is for you and I to understand this. Will you stay saved? Or will you reject Christ halfway and turn away from God and denounce Christianity? And will you, can you lose your salvation? Now, God says for the saints... God says, now, when he makes you a saint, he began the good work, he will preserve you. That is why it's called preservation of saints. He will preserve you as a saint, as a saved person, preserve you till the day of judgment. You will not become an unsaved person. In other words, you will not become an unsaved person. That is preservation of the saints. That is where the title is called Preservation of the Saints. The believers, the true believers. Now, then what about perseverance of the saints? What about perseverance? It's saying this, you will persevere. You will continue. No matter how difficult your Christian walk is, no matter what persecution you will face, you will continue in your faith. 
You will continue in your faith. You will persevere. But please know, you will persevere because God will perform it. God is the one that will enable and will keep you persevering. It is not talking about your own perseverance. All right? Understand that. So when you begin to just look at this verse very simply, it simply means that if you are saved because God started that, you will remain safe. You will not fall away from your faith. You will not give up your faith. You will not deny Christ and say, I don't believe he's, not, I don't believe he's God anymore. He's not God. I'll turn away from him. I reject him. I curse him. I will tell other people not to believe in him. All these are false. He said, you will not reach that stage. You will not. You will keep persevering. Even if your family says, if you believe in the Lord Je as God, Jesus Christ, as your God and your Savior, we will disown you. You will continue. Even you face the most difficult things, thing on earth, that to obey God, you will have to face this kind of persecution or that kind of persecution. God says, you will not give up. Not because you and I are so good, because he reminds us, God will perform it. For the saints, he will continue to perform it. All right, so once you understand that, this good work is God's initiative. The salvation work is God's initiative. And the salvation work will be maintained by God. He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Then you will begin to understand that a person who is born again, are you born again? A person who is born again will never be unborn. You will remain a child of God forever. I know in your mind you're thinking, but I have Christian friends. And recently we read in many articles, famous Christians, famous Christians um, who, write, who write songs and all that, that people look up to them, pastors even, that denounce the faith. And they say, I don't believe in God anymore. How do you explain that? Now we'll come to that. But just take God's word plainly first. All right? God says that unless you want to call God a liar. Now then, we ask ourselves, what is this outcome? This outcome is that if you are a genuinely safe person, your place in heaven is sure. You do not need to worry about that. God made that promise, Christ on earth made that promise to his disciples, right? I go away to prepare a place for you. That is his promise. Now, there are many other scriptures that confirms this. Because Christ says to the people, I give unto them eternal life. Now, God says, when I give eternal life, Christ said, I give to them eternal life. And they shall never perish. John 10, 28. They shall never perish. Never means never. Why? Why can Jesus Christ say that? Because Jesus Christ said, if I begin the good work, they will never perish because I will perform it. That is the assurance. Now, is it strong enough for you? Christ adds, John 10, 28, Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. You are so sure in his hand. There is, unless you say there is, someone, something more powerful than God. He said, no one, nothing will pluck you out of his hand. He will hold you fast. Now, there is a concept that you must understand before we move to learn about um, what it is not. Right? We also need to understand that. Now, God relates the surety of salvation to the Holy Spirit. Now, God says um, in Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, Now, in whom ye also trusted. Now, say, you have trusted in Christ as your Savior. After that, you have heard the word, the gospel of your salvation. Now, in whom you have believed. So, he said, for those who have turned to God for salvation, in whom you have believed, the gospel of your salvation. Then he says this, Ye were sealed in the Holy Spirit of promise. You are sealed. Now, God not only says, I promise to hold you. Let me tell you. God says, I seal you. I put my seal on you. you, are, you there is a seal on you that says, you are His. 
there still is a branding, a, a chop there that stays and says, no one can break that. That is my seal and that is my promise. You are mine permanently. The seal. The Holy Spirit is that, is that seal of assurance. Now, not only that, he says further, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. I, I read this to you again. Which the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. Same meaning, until the redemption, until the day of Christ. Until that day, you, the Holy Spirit is your earnest of your inheritance. Earnest. What is earnest? Now, this is down payment and assurance. Now, if you want to show your earnestness in buying a house, a car or something, you say, well, to show your earnestness, you put a down payment, right? That is what God is saying. Now, I will show you my earnestness that I will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Not only I seal you, this is given to you as my down payment. That is how sincere I am and how earnest I am. That's why Paul can say, I am so sure. Because we are, for us, we put a down payment, we can change our mind, we can break our word. But God do not. God does not break his word. God does not break his promise. See, all these great promises, clarity of assurance that you will not lose your salvation is in scriptures. Is in scriptures. Now, what is this assurance of salvation? What is it not? This preservation of sin. We must also learn what it is not. All right? Now, what it is not, first and foremost, the perseverance of saints that you will continue in your Christian walk. As you said earlier on, the reason is because God will preserve you. God will help you. God will keep you. It is not preservation of saints as many misunderstand and then they attack this doctrine and they write many things on blogs and websites accusing people who believe in this, this, this doctrine. Now they say that we believe preservation of sin means we must keep persevering. We must keep persevering and persevering. The moment we stop persevering, well, we lose, we, then we will lose our salvation. We are not teaching that at all. The perseverance of saints is not saying you must persevere in order to keep your salvation and be saved. Now, at this point, I want to say, maybe some of you have been coming to church for a long time. Maybe you hear perseverance of saints and you say, oh, th that means I must keep coming to church. I must keep obeying God. I must keep doing this, doing that, doing this, doing that so that I can get saved. No, God is not saying that. God said, I've begun the good work. He saved you. He saved you already. It's not I persevere and then hopefully God will begin that work of salvation in me. That is not the perseverance of saints, all right? So don't have that wrong understanding. Have you truly asked Jesus Christ to begin that good work in you? Have you truly asked Jesus Christ, God, you know, I can't persevere. I'm a sinner. Can you please save me? I want to turn away from my sins. I don't want these sins. Lord, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Wash away my sins and save me. Please begin this good work in me. And then help me to continue in my Christian walk because I am so sure of my salvation. Because I love you. Right? So perseverance of sins should not be mixed up with you persevering. Perseverance of sins simply means you can persevere because God will preserve you. That is what it means. You will persevere because God will pres preserve you. Now then, it is also not what the Armenians believe in. The Armenians also talk about preservation. But they refer to it as conditional preservation. As long as you persevere, God will preserve. As long as you persevere, God will preserve. No. Scriptures say, He began a good work. That start first. You get saved first and he will keep you persevering. So the conditional one means as long as you're persevering, God will preserve you. The moment you stop persevering, you lose your salvation. That is not what we are teaching at all. All right. So don't get all this mixed up. It's very simply just what verse 6 says. God saved you and he will continue to preserve your salvation. That is why you can keep persevering. Understand that. 
Now, but recently there are new attacks on this doctrine, on this understanding. Now, many modern Christians reject this and say, no, this idea of perseverance of saints is not good. We only like preservation of saints. We should never call it perseverance of saints. Why? Because they say perseverance has a picture of the Christian going through hardship, the Christian um, um, enduring things. That's why you've got to persevere, right? You say, no, it's, it's not a good image. But preservation is a good image. Preservation means God loves you, God will preserve you, God will keep you, and then you're, when you will definitely end up in heaven. Now, what's the problem with that? Because it's a Christianity that has no cross. Now, Christ said, endure hardness. Christ said, take up your cross, deny yourself. It is a Christianity that has self-denial on a straight and narrow path. That we are soldiers. Christ often calls us soldiers. Imagine you, you want to be a soldier. I want to be a soldier, but I expect the army to protect me. And please don't expect me to endure anything, all right? I only want to be preserved. That's all. God, is not, God did not promise a bed of roses. God says there will be challenges. God says they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. You will face those things, but you will be able to persevere because I am your preserver. Right? So we cannot also go to that extreme and say, well, you know, don't talk about perseverance. We, we just want to talk about preservation. Now then the last thing about what it is not is this. Now this, this doctrine also comes under attack because they say it promotes sinful living in Christianity. So the other extreme. One, say, one says that, well, I just want to know that I'm saved. Please don't talk about, and please don't talk about resisting temptation, resisting uh, undergoing trials, enduring trials. Please don't talk about that. Now the other extreme is, they say, well, you know, if you teach your salvation is sure, then there is a problem. Christians will say, since I'm surely going to heaven, I'll live in sin. I don't care. Then they say, this doctrine is evil. Now, when we read scriptures, we have to understand this principle. If God says something clearly, then that is what God says is the truth. Now, how people respond to it does not make that truth wrong. God says, I am the one who began the good work in you and I will keep you until the day of Jesus Christ. You will keep persevering. Take it as simply that is what God promised. Can a person say, well, I want to believe, well, that is great, you know, then I'll continue in my sin. Can a person think like that? Yes, of course. Can a person actually live like that? Yes, of course. But it doesn't make that doctrine wrong. Now, very often these are not saved people. They just want to go to heaven and say, please don't tell me to obey God, to obey Jesus Christ, to obey com commandments, to, to, to turn from sin. I just want the promise of going to heaven. There are people who, who are like that. So are we going to change the gospel now? Because God simply says, salvation is, is by grace, through faith, simply that. Are you going to say, well, you know, this doctrine, salvation by grace through faith, will also make people believe in Jesus Christ just to go to heaven and don't think and, and continue in sin. Are you going to change gospel of salvation by grace now? What God says is this. Take it plainly. You don't like preservation. You don't like perseverance, whatever. Put it aside. God promises that he will keep the saints till the end. But I hope at least now you understand the word preservation and perseverance used correctly. So must, you must understand what it is not. Because God deals with this. God says, shall we sin that grace may abound? Because there were people who were like that, even believers. And God says, please don't think that you're, just because your salvation is sure, you're going to heaven and then you just live in sin. God forbid. In fact, we learned this morning, there will be chastisements. Some will even die. God will take some Christians home because of that. The doctrine is not wrong. Christians can live wrongly. Separate that. Now, but then now, 
what must we learn? What must we learn? Now we know that is this promise, this promise that I will, if I am safe, I will to be truly saved. Now there is another thing that people attack: once saved, always saved. Osas, once saved, always saved. It is from this verse. God says, "I begun your salvation in you. I will do it until the day of Jesus Christ. You will not lose your salvation." There is one saved, you will always be saved. So it is also attacked for the same reasons, all right? Well, then people will continue in sin and all that. Can you deny one saved, always saved? You cannot. How people choose to live, how people want to take that statement is a separate thing. But God says, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. The Holy Spirit is your earnest, God's promised down payment. You cannot deny that God promises you that if you are saved, you will always be saved. You cannot deny that. Now, but then the question is this. Why are there those who deny? They write wonderful writings, wonderful Christian books, that stirred and encouraged many people that maybe the person who led you to Christ is one of them. At the end, they say, God is false. I deny him. All these are false. Jesus Christ is not God. It's all a myth. And then they go, then they go into the world. How do you explain that? If it's once saved, always saved. Now, it's very simple. God says once saved, always saved. You can't deny that then why is it that there are people who turn away from God along the way in their life? The simple answer is, if God says is one safe, always safe, and he is God, he is always true, then the, 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 the reason is they were not saved in the first place. Because God said, I have begun a good work and I will keep it. That's God's promise. For those that apostatize, then that good work never begun at all. They were not genuinely saved. Can a person talk about Christ, write about Christ, act like a Christian and all that, but is not inside a Christian? Of course. Of course. There are many who are like that. Now look at your Bible verse. Now you say, He that has begun a good work in you, in you, it is in you. No one can see inside you. These people, the, the good work in the person never existed in the first place. It is not the outward things that they do and say that we see the question is did was there ever salvation in the person because it is once saved always saved we didn't say always saved and that's it you're always saved but it's once saved you must have genuine salvation in the first place my dear friends you must be sure of that you must be sure of that paul says that to make your calling and election sure. Paul himself says, I serve God with fear and trembling, lest one day I'm a castaway. Paul is not saying that, Paul is not contradicting himself. One moment he says, one safe, always safe. Next moment he says, well, I'm afraid that I might lose my salvation. No, Paul is simply saying, you better make sure of the first part, once saved. You make sure of that part because once that part is sure, the good work begun, God will take over. God begins and God continues. Not God will take over. He continues. Paul is saying, be sure of that. Are you sure? There are many elderly that just think, I keep coming to church. The outward. You have to say, in me, is that saving grace inside me? Have I genuinely tell God, told God, I am a sinner, God. I'm a sinner. And I cannot cleanse away one single sin. Please forgive me. Please wash away my sins. Please be my God and my saviour. Now, young ones, teens, it's the same for you. Don't think just because you come from a Christian family, you are saved. Be very sure. One safe. A, are you one safe? Because you only need to be saved once, genuinely saved once. You do not get saved, lose your salvation, then get saved again, lose your salvation. Now, so why do these people leave? Because they were never saved in the first place. Now, but also don't be so quick to judge. Because sometimes... There are those that fall into grievous sins. 
Don't straight away jump to the conclusion, ah, they were never saved in the first place. Don't keep just wondering people are saved or not saved. Help them to understand the gospel. Don't make judgment all the time. Because there are some who may be saved, they are genuinely one saved. But even the genuinely saved can fall into grievous sin. David, King David, for example. Peter denied Christ three times. They can fall. Now, but some may be saved, they backslide. They backslide for a period, for a period. So reach out to them. Don't say, ah, you're never safe in the first place. Reach out to them. You do not know. Now, some may be genuinely not safe in the first place, and then they deny Christ. But it doesn't mean it's finished, as long as they are still alive. If they turn to Christ in genuine repentance for salvation, asking God, please forgive me. You must cleanse me. You must wash me. I want to turn away from my sin. They can come to that one day, one day, and become a genuinely one saved person and be forever saved. All right? So it's not finished, a person's life, until, well, he dies and at his deathbed, he's still denied. Sometimes even at his deathbed, you do not know. Well, the person have once believed and rejected, whisper the gospel in his ears. You do not know. They may recall and they may say, yes, now I remember. They may, mutter, they may pray in their heart, Lord, save me. I'm a sinner. You do not know. But the point of the doctrine is that believers know this. Ensure that you are saved. And God says, I will continue that work in you. Now the question is next then, how should, I, how should this doctrine change me? Because it's not supposed to remain in your head and that's all. You think God wants to tell this to you, just you and I just to say that, oh, okay, that's good understanding, knowledge. No. Now, this doctrine is supposed to change the Christian, knowing that if you're genuinely saved and we remain saved, now it's a great comfort. Once saved, always saved is a great comfort to the believer. Now, especially before death, maybe from the elderly, you wonder, you fear, but now you know, wow, this is a, such a wonderful promise from Philippians chapter 1, verse 6 to me. It's a great comfort. God's love towards you is unchanging. Now, that's the second thing that must impress in our hearts, upon us. Gratefulness, besides comfort, besides assurance. Like Paul says, be co being confident, besides being comforted by that confidence, now, it must draw us to gratefulness. Gratefulness. The reason why God says, I will continue and I will keep you is because of my love for you. Not because we are wonderful after salvation. Not because we are great. But God simply says, I set my heart, my love on you. Which is why he says, nothing can separate you from my love. Nothing nothing that is how much i love you that is why i will keep preserving you now we must be grateful of his unchanging love how do we show this gratefulness how do we show this gratefulness that god you will perform it that that you know with my lousy love for you with my um unwillingness to serve you and my, my, my lazy service towards you. I'm so unworthy. Lord, now that I understand this, I want to be grateful by truly living a life that reflects my gratefulness. That is what it is. One safe, always safe, is not just to stir us to be very thankful and then as elderly or as young people say, wow, now I'm just going to enjoy the world. I'm going to heaven. Yippee. That's it. And that's all. Now, there are Christians who don't understand this doctrine is supposed to stir a response, not just to make us feel happy that I'm going to heaven. 
I've said many times, you know, sometimes Christians, they think that, well, I'm going to heaven and therefore I just want to enjoy this life as much as possible and then I also want to enjoy heaven. Now, if that is your heart, you must really ask, are you truly saved? The truly saved will have a love for the Savior. Now then, the next thing, it must encourage us, so it comforts us. Now, it stirs us to grateful living that has fruit. Now, and it also must encourage us. Encourage us in what sense? Now, look at the verse. Look at the verse. Now, I say, He that, uh, that he which have begun a good work in you will perform it. Will perform it. How encouraging is that? God is the one that will perform our persevering. Now, it doesn't mean that then you just sit back and, and you, you don't do anything. But as you persevere, as you seek to obey his commandments in gratefulness to him, as you seek to live the Christian walk with him, God says, I will perform it. I will be always there. I will, like he told Joshua, I will never leave you or forsake you, right? I will be there. For how long? Until the day you die? No. Until the day of Jesus Christ. That is such a sure promise. Now, if God does it, now if it is us, if God says now, I began a good work in you, now it's up to you now. It's very discouraging because we know what our flesh is. But God says he is the one that will do it. Now, but this, this leads to another part of encouragement. What is it? The encouragement to live a holy life. The encouragement that a godly life is fully possible. For those of you who are discouraged, you just feel that, you know, all my Christian life, I keep, keep being bogged down by this besetting sin. I want to be holy, but, you know, these things keep coming back. Now, you are deceived into thinking that, well, this is, this is all there is. But God says, I will perform it. In other words, this good works gets better and better. This sanctification keeps going on. Meaning to say, because God is the one to perform it, then God, there is no reason, God, that I cannot overcome this sin. Because you are the one that is going to do it. Means I need to learn to trust in you. I need to believe that I can overcome this sin by your grace. It will happen. Maybe not immediately. Maybe for some reason, God wants to allow that for you to struggle, for you to learn, not for you to sin. Eh? But there are lessons, and you will overcome. There is no sin because of the preservation of God. There is no sin eh, that a Christian can feel, this is going to be with me till the day I die. I'll tell you honestly that many Christians, myself included, think like that when we first get saved, right? There is a particular sin, you call it your master sin, that you can't seem to get rid of it. And you think it'll be with you till the day you die. No, Christ says, till, God says, till the day you die, I keep working in you. The progressive sanctification work will keep going on. So, Christians, why would you not begin to say, Lord, I want to. You will work. You will help. I want to. Now, but... Another encouragement is this. Knowing that you're once safe and you will always safe and you will always end up in the presence of the living God for eternity in heaven, now means this. It must encourage you and I to live for that eternity. It must encourage us to live with eternity's value in view. Because God says you, you will surely end up there. Now when something is so sure, it must stir you to live for it. Isn't it true? Now, if I were to say, well, well, some parents say, well, we are going on a holiday. Then the child say, well, that, you know, you always say that, but it doesn't happen. But I say, no, for sure, tomorrow we are going. How would you pack your bags? How will you prepare whatever you need to prepare? You will have zeal. You will have, you will have, um, uh, a deep desire to quickly get things ready because we are definitely going. 
So assurance of salvation is not, for, is not to stir us to enjoy this earth. It's a wrong thinking. So Paul says, how can you think like that? Shall we sin that grace may abound? Now look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Later on, Paul will elaborate further. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Paul says there is no sin that he cannot overcome through Christ because of he who has begun a good work will continue it. Now parents, maybe you're struggling with bringing up godly seed. But knowing two things that surely God will help. Surely heaven is where I will end up. My child, if he's saved, will end up. It is worth living. It is worth doing everything I can to bring up godly seed for that eternity. If, not, if it's not sure, then never mind. Let it be a doctor, a whatever, professional. At least enjoy this earth, right? But no, God says that is sure. It changes your heart. So when we think of all this, it must stir us to live for that sure eternity, right? That is why God calls us strangers and pilgrims on earth. But lastly, there is warning as well. Warning. Now, what is this warning? Well, first and foremost, we already said, make sure that you are safe first, because once safe, always safe, is the promise to those who have the good work that have begun in them. Has that good work begun in you? Have you turned to God? Now, there is this warning that because God says, I will keep working on you, I do not abandon project halfway. It means that when you and I go astray, it means that when you and I begin to live a life that does not glorify him, God says, no, no, I'm going to keep working on you. Your salvation is sure. I'm not going to let my child live like that on earth. I am going to keep working on you because your chief end is to glorify me. Now, it means this. You can choose to say, well, once saved, always saved, and you may be genuinely saved. But if you choose the path to say, then let me just not think about things and just enjoy sin on earth and live for, for myself and my family on earth, because God will keep working. Now, how does God work? Now, when it reaches that stage, God will chastise. That is why God told the Corinthian Christian, many of you are weak. It can be even physical chastisement. And he still refused, I will take you home. Because you're, you are truly my child. I'm not going to let you live in sin and bring my name into shame. So there is this warning. Now because, and I hope we take this to heart, because God will keep working on you till the day of Jesus Christ. It means this. Even if you are, if you are truly saved and you backslide, and you choose to remain in backslid backslidden state, you don't want to come back. I'm talking about genuinely safe people, all right? If you choose that path to remain there for a long time and keep delaying, consequences will occur, for sure. Because sin by itself has consequences. Sin by itself has consequences. But because God will keep working on you, one day you will you will. God will draw you by His Holy Spirit. You will want to come back to Him. You will want to turn away from your sin. You will, because that is God's promise. You will. But when you do so at that time, you will have incurred so much consequences in your life. You will have, have made so many decisions that have now will pull you down, commitments and so on, that when God draws you back, God says, enough already. I'm going to work in it and you will come back. You will find that all the burdens and all the things that you're tied to is going to be such a pain in your life while you live that Christian walk. Now, I cannot describe how many Christians I've seen, and it makes me fear for myself, that are like that. Because of God's promise, you will return. They choose to make wrong choices. People tell, don't marry an unbeliever. Never mind, I'm safe, I'm going to heaven. Let me enjoy this. They marry an unbeliever. They enjoy, so-called, 
their life on earth for maybe five, ten years together. Then one day, God says, I promise you, I will draw you back. I will not let you leave this earth like that. God draws them back, and then they want to live for God. Now their heart wants to obey Him, but there are so many wrong choices already. Husband says, or wife says, no, I do not want our children to go to church. Oh, the heart pain, the heart ache. I want my child to love God. No, I don't want them to believe. You can go yourself. Or, no, I don't want you to, maybe once a month I'll, you go, but at the time, please don't go. A lot of heartache. Then when God draws you back, or some even, they lose the privilege of service. Pastors, certain sins immediately defrocks you. When God draws them back, they want to, they want to so much. They remember their calling, the joy of serving the Lord. But they know they can never return to the ministry because of certain sins has disqualified them from the office. There are consequences. Don't think that once safe, always safe. Means there are no consequences on earth. It's a very painful life. It is better to say, Lord, once safe, always safe, therefore I live for the eternity now when I'm young. Have a clean slate. Keep growing. Keep letting Him work on you. Keep being more and more godly, more and more holy. Glorify Him, serve Him. It's better to not waste that time. Once saved, always saved, yes, you will end up in eternity. Do you want to waste that life on earth? No. It must stir us to the opposite. Right? Now, but last but not least, many like to use the example of Peter and David. Well, is it true that Christians can fall into grievous sins? Yes, because we know in both Peter and David's case, when they fell into grievous sins, they were saved. We know that. Many say, well, you know, then maybe I'm like Peter and, or, or, or David. Yes, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm backslider, I'm, I live in sin, but, but, ah, Peter, David, I'm once safe, always safe. I'm going to heaven. Now, I caution you with these words. Many like to use that example. But what is forgotten is this. Peter and David, majority of their lives were obedient, fruitful lives. Not backslided and sinful. If, you're, if the majority of your living is backslided and sinful and you want to think that you are like Peter and David, you need to think again. Peter and David were once safe, always safe, but they were not people that were living in sin most of the time. So if you are, don't think, well, I'll use Paul's word, make your calling and election sure. Do not assume. Do not assume. Now with all this, then we ask ourselves, having hit knowledge about all these doctrines, they must translate to change our love towards God. He saved you and He promised to keep you. How can we be ungrateful and live lives that, that, that denies Him by the way we live? We cannot. Let us rise to sing the closing hymn. 347, 347.